This is Undead Viking, and this is Fire of Eidolon. Fire of Eidolon is the next game from the fine folks uh, that made Dark Rock Ventures, a game that I very much enjoyed. Uh, and you, I did a video for it, so you can kind of check that out if you want to. But this is a game, as you can probably guess, they're making it look like the old uh, Nintendo cartridges with the pixel art. This is a co-op game where each player will take on the role of a hero uh, who is trying to investigate this dungeon, trying to destroy these evil artifacts that will allow them to claim another artifact that will allow them to prevent uh, the end of the world as the dark sorcerer attempts to destroy everything as and as we know it and, and bend our reality to his evil whim, if you will. Uh, the game uh, it plays relatively quickly for a lot of players. I, I was playing this game with four and five and even six people and we were still able to wrap the game up in about an hour um, and I found it to be a very very fun very very immersive uh, enjoyable co-op experience. So why don't I go ahead and show you how to play uh, Fire of Eidolon and then we will I wonder what they came up with the name of Eidolon. I have no idea. Maybe I should google that to see what it means. But I'll go ahead and I will show you how the game is played and then we'll come back here and I'll give you my final thoughts. All right cool. All right, let's show you how to play Fire of Eidolon. I've gone ahead and put all six of the heroes on this tile in the middle. That's called the Vestibule Tile. Uh, that's where everybody starts, and theoretically, if you win the game, that's where everybody's going to end up. Uh, to achieve a total victory, you have to destroy, or I'm sorry, you have to destroy, bring the Fire of Eidolon uh, back to the Vestibule, and all the heroes have to survive and make it back there. If you manage to bring the Fire of Eidolon back here, but not all the heroes survive, you still win, but it's considered a partial victory. If you are unable to do so, and the Dark Dark Sorcerer shows up, uh, he destroys the world, and obviously then uh, you lose. But So uh, the way this game is played is that each person will take a turn and they'll move their hero out and about into uh, the dungeon, and the dungeon will be created by uh, drawing these tiles, uh, and then you explore, and then you'll place them. You'll notice that these tiles, not all of them will have an, an entrance on each four uh, all four uh, spots, like this one does. But then you get to place it, you say, I'm exploring in this direction, you place it down and then you move your meeple onto that spot, unless you have a rule or a skill that allows you to not move in there. Now, the thing is, is that depending upon the color, you're going to place one of, this is blue and that's a blue room, you're going to place a piece of the artifact, uh, the three dark artifacts that you have to destroy, so you can actually claim the Fire of Eidolon, uh, you know, in there. And then the players are, what they're going to do is they're going to try to collect at least six of those artifacts, uh, those partial artifacts, because you need six pieces uh, to then bring it back to the blue altar, which is a tile in here that you have to find somewhere, and then you turn those in and then you destroy one of these, uh, one of these three dark artifacts. You have to destroy all three of the dark artifacts before you can even claim the Fire of Eidolon, and of course then you have to also find the altar that the Fire of Eidolon is on. Now, that seems well, all well and good, right? You might be saying, well, how does the game even play, and what, what's stopping us from doing so? Well, this deck, this ritual deck, uh, at the end of each player's turn, not after everybody takes a turn, at the end of each player's turn, you will turn a certain number of cards over, depending upon the difficulty of the game and what threat level you're at, and those cards will have a location on them, like this one says Corrupted Mages. And if the Corrupted Mages tile is out there, you will place a dark... Uh, a dark cultist on that location. Now dark cultists can be killed by the heroes, it's just an action point, you destroy them. But if you ever have a spot that gets two dark cultists on it, then it takes this particular room and it destroys it. It throws it into the void, never to be seen again, and along with it if you haven't collected the uh, the, the partial fragment, that's destroyed as well. And so the Dark Cultists die as well, but that's all well and good. They, they, knew, they knew that going in when they decided to worship the Dark Sorcerer. If a hero happens to be on uh, the Void and they have an open location, they can dive out of it, and like then they'll be lying on their side like this, and on their turn it takes one action point to stand up, but they don't die. If a hero is on a location, and for whatever reason maybe their, their pathway to get out is blocked, uh, and they go to the Void, then of course then the hero will go into the void as well and die. All right, so you with me so far? Okay, cool. Now the big thing is, is that you need at least six of these pieces to be able to turn them in at the, at the altars that allow you to destroy these artifacts. 
there's only seven of each one. So what that means is you can lose one, but if you lose one more, then you're done. You can't possibly win the game. So you know that's why uh, this is kind of like the, the 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 pressure, the anxiety, if you will. This deck kind of pushes that forward. Now to determine how many cards you will draw depending upon the threat level in each turn. Depends upon the difficulty that you're taking, like this is the beginner, and all the way to uh, difficulty heroic, and heroic and extreme, uh, very hard, hard, normal, and beginner. Now, you, can, you obviously the game says start a beginner, if you will, uh, to begin with, but you'll notice that there, here's this little threat track. You have this little marker here, uh, and then you'll you know, basically put that on there, and depending upon where this is pointing, that would be one card that you draw, and one card, and two, and so forth, like so, until you finally get to the end. Now, when you get to the end here, that's when, like, basically the Dark Sorcerer is going to show up. So you need to have everybody back, and you need to have that Fire of Eidolon uh, back in that location. So a couple other mechanisms I wanted to just explain really quick. Um, so each player will have a different hero. You have a Paladin, Warrior, and so forth. And then each one of these has a special ability that allows them to do a certain action. Um, they actually have two. One of them is like a one-time use. Like the one down here on each one of these cards is a one-time use that they can only use once during the game. But the one on top is something they can use. So like Paladin Smite, you may tag a cultist in any chamber uh, regardless of your own current location. Now, normally it takes one action point to kill a cultist if you're in the same spot as them. So like if this is the situation, you use an action point to kill that cultist and get rid of it. But Obviously, the Paladin's ability of being able to hit something from a long distance away is very good. Their uh, Holy Light is you may attack cultists in any chamber, regardless of your current location, and you may also automatically attack any cultists in any of the other four chambers adjacent to that original target cultist. So, like, you can obviously, like, a big giant explosion, but you'd only be able to use Holy Light once during the game. Some skills will be passive. You can tell they're passive because of the fact that it says passive on there. So the rogue is fine secrets. Whenever you use a move action, you may pass through any walls between chambers if at least one doorway is present on the other side of the wall. Now what that means, just so you have an idea, is, let me draw a, a card here. So like here's uh, the, the skeletal guardians. Now I should mention that the, the stuff on here, yes, it says skeletal guardians, but you're not fighting the Skeletal Guardians. It's just it's just a picture so you know when you draw the card, you know where you put the cultist. But you'll notice there's like no door here, no door here. If this one was like right there, that would be a way that the rogue could actually skip through and have a different pathway than normal. So pretty straightforward, right? And that's what the game is. It is really straightforward, but it is very, very difficult because of the fact that as the game goes on, you will ramp up the difficulty of what's happening. See, like you'll say, uh, the threat level uh, goes up uh, whenever you run out of the ritual deck, which you will do quickly, and also um, after all three dark relics are destroyed. And so when you destroy them, and so then as this ramps up, obviously you're going to start going through more and more of these cards. And there's actually like kind of cool thing where it says one, and then two, and then back to one, so it kind of gives you a little breather there. But, you know, still, you know, it just keeps ramping up slowly as far as the many cards you draw. Now, eventually, like I said, you're going to find uh, rooms that look like, you know, here. Uh, this is the Shadow's Focus. And so, you know, and this, uh, you could get lucky and have it show up, like, right away. And you just go ahead and place the Shadow's Focus on there. And so then you know where it is, but now you got to race around and find all the different parts to the, so you can actually come back here and destroy it. You know, and eventually what will happen is you will find uh, the Fire of Eidolon in some location. Here's the Fire of Eidolon. You'll find the Fire of Eidolon somewhere. And you know, after, and only after, all three of the uh, different artifacts are destroyed, you can then go in there and grab it and head back to the vestibule. Now, one last thing, just so you know, in order to actually collect these little markers that would be on these spots, the tributes of the different uh, heroes actually come into play because of the fact that it takes a certain number of action points to be able to collect those. So, like the rogue, you, you can see like you, they, have, he has, they have three action points, they have one strength, uh, three dex, and two intelligence. So in order to collect the item, you have to take uh, four minus the attribute that, that the room is uh, assigned to. So this one is red, so it's strength. So for the rogue, 
to collect that particular item, you take four minus their strength of one, and that would take three action points, their entire turn, just to pick that up. And then if he was here, since it's a two, it would be four minus two, it would take two action points to collect that particular item. And so other things, and they actually, really nice, uh, I like it when they have character boards that actually give you all the little actions here so you can just see those. So like exchange, that allows you just to hand off if you're in the same room as somebody and you have a bunch of these, you know, or a bunch of tokens, you can hand them to somebody so they can go. They have to be in the same room as you. That takes an action point um, to explore, as I said, is like just to place a, to place one down. That's an action point, then you move into that location. Uh, to move, just in normally, that's one action point uh, per spot. Attacking is one action point, as I said, to kill one. Um, you can wait, you can just say, I'm waiting, and then you're done. Like, you, you, you're you waiting for somebody to show up, or if you made it back to the middle of vestibule, you're waiting for everybody to get back there, so you can win the game in full, and so on and so forth. Then, the, obviously, skills and the challenges take certain number of action points, and then to destroy a relic or to uh, use the fire, um, you use one action point for those as well. So, um, you know, I mean, basically, the cool thing about the game is, as with any of these tile games, is as, you know, you, as you're creating, you know, the, the cool uh, the rooms and what have you, it's the dun the, making the dungeon for me is always, like, the fun part for any of these tile laying games and seeing it kind of be created as it goes along. I really dig uh, the, the old school art. I mean, you can make pixel games from here until eternity. I'm always going to enjoy the artwork that they, they use for these. And... As for a co-op, it is very difficult. And like I said, the leeway you have with only being able to lose one of these as the game progresses, and then you're done, uh, it makes the game very difficult, even on the, the easier settings. So I found this one to be a lot of fun. Um, we found it really challenging, but I'll talk more about that in my final thoughts. Yeah, see, it's just not the same uh, without a box. But anyway, so there you go. Fire of Eidolon. You should have a really good idea of how the game is played. So thank you for sitting through that. Um, as I said, I found the game to be very challenging. I'm going to go quickly. If you've watched my videos about co-op games before, you'll know that I have a very, very strict set of rules for them. Uh, for the starters, um, the game should kick my butt the very first time that I play it because it's, I'm fresh to the, new to the game. I don't understand the nuances. I don't understand the game fully. I'm kind of learning as I go. Um, the game has a leg up on me, and so it should be able to beat me. And uh, it did, so that was good. I didn't play a beginner, though. I did play it normal. I'm, I am, of course, a professional or semi-professional board game reviewer guy. So I did play it normal level, and uh, it did still kick my butt. So maybe I would have won if we played a beginner, but mm, who knows? We had some bad luck that very first game. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, like when I play a four-player game, and if everybody at the, every, everybody at the table is an equal level of far as knowledge, of the game. I feel like I should only win that game uh, one out of every four times that I play. Uh, I still I feel the exact same way about cooperative games. Um, I, I shouldn't win that often and it should be a challenge so when I do win I should feel uh, really satisfied with myself. And when I lose, this is kind of like uh, rule number 2.a, uh, when I lose, I should still enjoy myself. I should have a very good story. I should have some immersion. I should have some wonderful moments of anticipation, uh, some maybe good luck and bad luck type of things. And this game has that. There's something so wonderful when you know, because you can get through this deck pretty quickly, um, there's something where you're, you're kind of like wondering. Um, and also, remember, you, you do get rid of the card that um, like if you destroy a room and you send a room to the void, uh, you do get rid of that card and it's gone. So like y when you reshuffle this, you're losing more and more cards. And so that kind of pushes the threat deck up a little quicker. The cool thing is, is that just as an aside here, mechanicism wise, is that uh, like, if you are lucky enough to collect the, the pieces, don't ever let a piece go by when you're playing this. Like even if it takes your entire turn to collect it, take the entire turn to collect it because then that's okay if, if the room is destroyed you got the piece in your hand you, you it isn't taken away from you at that point so you can kind of you know hedge your bets a little bit um but you know you'll find yourself like as you're you know making the the uh the rooms like you will have your pathways like to, you know vanishing behind you and that's one of the ways why it's tough to win like a total victory is because you'll get towards the end of the game you've run out of these tiles basically to draw and certain heroes just have no way of getting back uh to to the main room and so when that happens it's just like well sorry but uh we're gonna go ahead and destroy the dungeon uh have fun in the void <laughs> you know we'll make sure we have name a high school after you though don't worry about it
But, um, no, so it's it's one of those things where, like, the game, it's tough to get that. You can win, but it's tough to get in that total victory. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a couple minutes here. So, um, and the final thing I have is that I don't want to ever feel like one person's bossing everybody around. Everybody should feel like they're contributing. Everybody should feel like they have a special skill and a special ability uh, that allows them to contribute and uh, be a meaningful part of the solution and, and the winning of the game. And this one does that as well. So it, it hits on all three of my cylinders uh, that I need uh, for a, uh, a cooperative game. And, you know, to boot, it has a really cool theme. Uh, it throws back to my old school uh, Nintendo days, and um, I really, really dig the pixel art. I've said that a million times over, but I can say it again. I love pixel art. I love pixel art in games. But anyway, so the final thing I want to talk about as far as winning the game, like, Fully, like you, you, you actually like pull off uh, the victory. Everybody survives, and which is tough to do, you know, when you have a ton of heroes. Like you know, and I should also mention that when they play with three or less people, it says you can play this game solo. I did, you know, teach myself the game. Uh, but it says that each person should play multiple heroes. So like, if you're playing with two, um, you should play with like two heroes each, or maybe even three. But if you play with three. Give everybody two heroes, you know, just because it, you know, otherwise you're gonna kind of. I mean, I guess you could play with three. I mean, it would be tough, though. You need those heroes to be able to scout around and find other stuff and, and, and bring it back, if you will. But anyway, so uh, the cool thing uh, about this is that, and I'm not going to show you what's in here, uh, but it's kind of legacy-esque. There is this little bit of added fun that was put in the thing. It basically, this envelope said that after you defeat uh, the game, uh, don't open the game until you after you have defeated the game uh, at, at, any, at any difficulty level. But defeated it fully, meaning that you destroyed uh, the Dark Sorcerer and every single one of the heroes survived. And then you can open up the envelope here, like I did, and there is stuff inside. Now, so that was really cool that I had that. And so it took me, we won some partial victories, and I think it was the fourth time we played the game where we actually pulled out the full victory and we got to see uh, what was in the little box here, or in the envelope, if you will. So there's some cool little things in there. I'm not going to give it away. It's a spoiler, so I'm not going to give it away. But it's something super awesome. So uh, there you go. That is uh, Fire of Eidolon. If you have any questions about the game, please ask away. I'll be happy to answer those to the best of my ability. Um, as I said, if you like co-op games, if you like this kind of throwback feel, I think you're going to love this one. So go ahead and check it out. Uh, thank you very much for all your time. And until next time, I'm the Ended Viking, telling you to have yourself one heck of an awesome day. All right, bye-bye.